going to discuss the normal modes of two coupled oscillators. Um, so let's start by considering um, a fixed wall to which we attach um, a mass by a spring. Um, this is maybe our canonical, our, our ideal example um, of a system. Now I'm going to define um, the coordinate of that as being psi 1 um, and at this dashed line psi 1 is equal to 0. Now we can do the same thing again. We can put a second mass um, somewhere over here and we can attach that by a spring um, to another wall. Uh, again we'll have spring constant s and we'll have again a coordinate which we'll call psi 2. Again it's equal to 0 at the dashed line. Um, now as we've set this up we can write the equations m psi 1 double dot is equal to minus s psi 1 um, and m psi 2 double dot is equal to minus s psi 2. And so far that's not actually very interesting. Um, we aren't doing anything different, we just have two oscillators. So what I'm going to do now um, is I'm going to bring in a new spring. Um, I'll do it in a different color so that it looks different. And I'm going to say that's going to have spring constant k. Uh, and the question that we want to ask is what actually happens to the motion of the oscillators when we have this joining spring k? Obviously we're going to have to change um, the equations. Um, you can work out for yourself if you want to. It's fairly easy. Um, let's think about this. If we move psi 1 to the left, to the negative x direction, let's say, um, that's going to extend k and there will be a restoring force to the right. Um, so that means we need a minus k multiplying psi 1. Um, now if we extend psi 2 to the right in the positive x direction, that's also going to give a positive restoring force on the first oscillator. So since I've got this minus sign outside the bracket, we'll say that's minus psi 2. Um, if you want to, you could just write that as minus k psi 1 plus k psi 2 and then factorize it. That's clearer. Um, if we do the same thing for psi 2, then we find we have minus k and this time it's psi 2 minus psi 1. Um, as that stands, those are two coupled equations and they're rather complex to solve um, in this form. Mathematically, um, we can simplify this rather easily. Um, we note that if we add them or subtract them, we revert to a simple harmonic oscillator equation. So adding or subtracting these equations will give us simple harmonic motion. Um, not necessarily the simple harmonic motion of the individual oscillators, um, but ne nevertheless simple harmonic motion. So let's write that down. Um, so if we add them, we end up with m d2 by dt squared of psi 1 plus psi 2, um, and that's going to equal minus s psi 1 plus psi 2, um, and the two terms in k cancel. If we subtract them, then we have m d2 by dt squared of psi 1 minus psi 2, um, and that's equal to minus s psi 1 minus psi 2, um, and then you find actually it's minus 2k psi 1 minus psi 2, because these two terms in k add, uh, they combine, and so you can rewrite that as minus brackets s plus 2k brackets psi 1 minus psi 2. Um, and so you can see that if you're willing to treat psi 1 plus psi 2 as a single variable, we have a simple harmonic motion um, similarly for psi 1 minus psi 2. Um, and psi 1 plus psi 2 is the, the center of mass motion, um, or it's a version of the center of mass, um, or if you prefer, it's the average um, of the two oscillators. Psi 1 minus Psi 2 um, is the relative separation. So it's the change in the relative separation of the two oscillators over time. Um, so what you should notice actually is that in this system we have two degrees of freedom. 
Um, this is a concept that you should encounter a number of times during a physics degree, uh, the idea of degrees of freedom. Um, and effectively what we're saying is what are the free variables in the system? Now, as I've written it, the free variables are the positions of the oscillators, um, and because there are two oscillators, each oscillating in one dimension, you end up with two variables. There's no reason why we need to use those variables, though. As I've shown you, in fact, by rewriting equations, we can use the variables, one of which gives us the average position of the system, and the other of which gives us the relative separation of the oscillators. So we could define those variables as, let's say, QA, which we'll say is Psi1 plus Psi2, um, and QB is equal to Psi1 minus Psi2. Um, we could, if we wanted to, um, divide each of these by two to make the maths a little more easy. Um, if you go on and do slightly more complex versions of normal modes, you'll find that quite often people introduce a factor of the square root of the mass here. Um, that makes the later maths easier. If we do that, um, then we just use the standard solution for the simple harmonic oscillator, say that QA must equal capital A little a, that's the amplitude for the first oscillator, um, e to the i omega a t plus phi a, and QB is a b, e to the i omega b t plus phi b. Um, so we have two simple harmonic motions, and if we want, we can then recover the motions of the individual oscillators, psi 1 or psi 2, by adding together and sub or subtracting QA and QB. Um, so notice here that psi 1 is going to equal a half of QA plus QB, um, and psi 2 is going to equal a half of QA minus QB. Um, so we can always recover Psi 1 and Psi 2 if we want to. Um, naturally, we need to specify Omega A and Omega B. Um, omega A is just the square root of S over M. Um, omega B is the square root of S plus 2K over M. Um, if we want to solve for an any motion of the system, um, we need to specify the boundary conditions. or thus the initial conditions. So let's just look at a couple of examples of that. Um, the simplest one, um, so let's say version 1, I'm going to say Psi 1 is equal to Psi 2 is equal to some constant, let's say capital C, um, at t equals 0 and Psi 1 dot is equal to psi 2 dot is equal to 0. Um, that implies that QA is equal to QB, um, which is equal to 2C, um, because, sorry, no, that's wrong, that's, <laughs> I'm jumping ahead of myself. Um, that implies that QA is equal to 2C. Um, and of course, QB as I should have said, is equal to zero. Um, so what are we doing? What does that motion represent? Well, um, if QB is zero, that means that um, AB, the amplitude of that second mode, is zero, while the amplitude of the first mode, AA, is 2C. So we've actually only excited one of the two modes. Um, and looking at the initial conditions, that makes sense. What we've done is we've displaced the two oscillators by the same amount. We haven't stretched the string, the spring K um, and so basically we just have a slow oscillation backwards or forwards of the two oscillators in phase. Um, a slightly more interesting case is when we set Psi 1 is equal to C, um, Psi 2 is equal to 0, um, and again we say, and these are again at t equals 0, um, and we also say that Psi 1 dot is equal to Psi 2 dot is equal to 0. Um, so that is equivalent to moving one of the masses um, and then letting go. <laughs> So in this case, we see that um, QA is equal to C. We see that QB is equal to C. Um, and we can derive the phases phi A equals phi B equals zero from the condition on the velocity. Um, and so we might, for instance, by writing psi 1 is equal to a half of QA plus QB um, find that when we take the real parts, that's equal to C over 2 into cos of 
omega at plus cos of omega vt. Um, now this motion should look familiar. This is actually just beating. Um, so provided omega a and omega b are fairly close, then what we'll find is that each oscillator will describe a motion given by beats. Um, I'll try and sketch that. So here's an axis psi 1, um, here's time, and so we'll see that it will go like this. You'll get um, a gradual increase. Oops, slipped there. Um, let me just try that again. You'll get a gradual increase um, in the magnitude, which will then decrease again. Um, and if I change to a different color, I can then outline um, the envelope for that motion, um, which will look something like this. Um, and so that you'll see that every so often we will get a zero amplitude um, on the oscillator. If I was to draw Psi 2, um, what we would find is that these two would be out of phase with each other. Um, so Psi 2 would reach a maximum when Psi 1 reached a minimum and vice versa. Um, and so what we've done is we've solved the complex motion of the system. And if you were to excite this with a couple pendulums, um, as I tried to do during the lectures, the overall response looks rather complicated, um, potentially even slightly counterintuitive. It does look very strange to see a pendulum stopping dead. Um, but that comes about because we've excited a combination of the two normal modes. You can extend this method to um, further normal modes. You can, you can have the motion of three oscillators or even n oscillators. Um, in general, solving that requires the use of matrices and an eigenvalue equation. Um, and you'll find that the eigenvalues are the frequencies of the, mo of the normal modes. The eigenvectors are just the combinations of the individual components. Um, that will come later in your physics course. Um, and we won't cover that now, but it's just saying that that's one of the ways that you can approach it.